Welcome to ACF Chefs Forum. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to have experts here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the food service industry. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's very special webinar and appreciate you all tuning in for this exciting demonstration. I hope you're ready to be inspired. I know I'm from New Hampshire, so I'm wicked excited for today's presentation. Today we'll be taking questions for the chefs live during the webinar as we are able. Please be sure to use the chat function to collaborate with other chefs and students tuning in and the Q&A function to post questions to today's featured chef. All right, so let's get the conversation going in the chat. Please let us know where you're tuning in from today. And now some information from Jennifer, our friend at Massachusetts Restaurant Association Educational Foundation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Jackie. As she said, I'm Jen Almeida and I'm from Massachusetts Pro Start. And we are so happy to welcome all of you to today's demo. And we are excited to have such a talented chef here to inspire us. So a little background on today's featured chef. Uh, chef Chris Vio was a contestant on season 18 of Top Chef on Bravo and is the chef owner of Greenleaf. And you know what, Jeff, I forgot to ask about how to pronounce your restaurant name. So Assam, I'm hoping that was correct. He'll correct me later. Both located in Milford, New Hampshire upon graduating from Johnson and Wales University. He moved to Boston where he spent three of his most formative years at Forbes four-star rated restaurant DeVoe in Back Bay where he worked his way up to sous chef. Uh, Chef Vio has continually been working throughout the years to challenge himself by pushing the boundaries, taking himself out of his comfort zone to hone in on his craft. And just last week, he was recognized as a semifinalist for the James Beard Award in the category of Emerging Chef. Congratulations, Chef. Chef Vio's food is rustic in its approach, yet refined by his use of classical techniques. Chef focuses primar primarily on seasonal products, most of which are grown locally, which helps to fuel his passion when creating his menus. He is constantly exploring new ideas, styles, trends, and concepts to keep fueling his passion and believes that every day there's an opportunity to learn something new. Chef, on behalf of all of the culinary students who are tuning in today, we are so thrilled to have you here with us today. Back to Jackie. Thank you, Jen. We are going to launch a quick poll. Um, we are curious to see however, how, how many of you have ever tried Asian cuisine before. Um, so please do um, take that poll so we can see um, where our baseline is. So this is looking pretty great. We're going to be pretty brief. Um, but Chef, it looks like about 50% of the uh, for tuning in today have tried Haitian cuisine, which is great. And I know that everyone's gonna learn a lot. So at this time, please welcome Chef Keith Saracen to help us kick off today's presentation. Chef Saracen is an author, chef speaker and restaurateur. In 2012, Chef Keith started the Farmer's Dinner, which hosts upscale dinners uh, on local farms across New England. He hosted over a hundred farm to table events and fed more than 19,000 customers raising over 188,000 dollars for local farms. He has a deep passion and respect for Indian food, which also led him to start Atma, a one-of-a-kind pop-up tasting experience showcasing food from the Indian subcontinent presented with modern techniques and styles. Many of you have, you have met Chef Keith at ACF National Convention, and great news, he'll be back again in Las Vegas, so don't miss out on seeing him live, cooking, sharing his knowledge, and signing books. Uh, Chef Keith and Chef Chris, welcome. And at this time, I'm passing the presentation over to you. Thank you. I am uh, so excited to be here. Uh, thank you, ACF. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everyone who's doing this. Um, if you guys don't know Chef uh, Chris Vio, you're about to, because not only is he an amazing chef, uh, he's one of my really, really good friends. Um, he's just amazing. So I'm going to turn it over to Chef, and we are going to get this thing started. If you have some questions today, use that Q&A box, and let's get started. Any questions you have, feel free. And uh, without further ado, Chef, turn it over to you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and everything. I appreciate all the kind words, and you guys are too, uh, too modest, and uh, you're humbling me, really. 
Uh, it's been quite the journey and kind of sharing this experience with you here is a reintroduction of who I am and who I'm becoming. Um, as you know, through many stages of your culinary career, you're going to go through growth. And that, that could be through a, uh, any course of the path that you're on. And um, through recent experiences, I've kind of learned to develop um, the understanding of who I want to become as a chef. So every day is a new moment for me. There's constantly changes that I'm going through on a personal level and on uh, my path of discovery for who I am as a chef, what kind of food I want to create, and how that translates to the kind of soul and energy that I'm going to be putting into some dishes that I do create in the future. Um, so yeah, as Keith uh, was mentioning, we are really good friends. So this is going to be an interesting conversation. I know he's going to ask all the right questions and make me look as best as I can be, you know. Um, but I appreciate you all being on here uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, joining us on this very important discussion, especially on the last day of Black History Month, where I can shed some light on some Haitian culture and give a little bit of insight of some uh, Haitian food that I like creating with my family and during some of the dinners at uh, Ensemble, which we had just launched last year. So a little bit of my background. I started in uh, culinary school at Johnson & Wales. From there, I went off to working in Boston. And um, after Boston, I kind of left and wanted to kind of dis discover my own path, which is why I came back to New Hampshire. And through some of my uh, explorations, that's where Keith and I kind of linked up. And that's where our story began. Um, through all of that, launching Greenleaf and developing into this brand, I was somehow stumbled upon joining the experience of uh, Top Chef, which is a whole different conversation for another day. Um, but that kind of sparked some new interest in me for creating this uh, brand with my family of wanting to dive back and kind of um, understanding and respecting our culture through food and reintroducing the food that we grew up eating and appreciating it more so now that I have a daughter and wanting to translate all these recipes over to her um, and the future generations to come. So I spoke with my parents and just asked them, I was like, all right, I want to kind of be able to share honor these recipes and preserve our family history through food. So we began um, just with a, with a monthly pop-up, um, just discussing what the recipes were that we grew up eating and um, starting writing those recipes down and documenting all those things and introducing them to the community. And it's just incredible to see the amount of support that we have garnished from all that. And to this day, just a year later, to be able to kind of just continue to flow into that. We're still getting the traction. We're doing these monthly dinners. And the best part of it is just coming together as a family and doing this all together. So the recipe that I'm cooking for you today is a uh, pool non sauce. So that is a uh, Creole marinated and braised or stewed chicken. Uh, I'm going to be serving that with uh, diri a pois. Um, so diri cole is the national rice dis dish of Haiti. Um, and that's traditionally made with kidney beans, but on my, in my inventory on, at my house, I only had uh, um, pinto beans. So I'm actually just gonna be using those. So I'm not gonna call it diri cole. I'm just gonna call it diri a pois. Uh, so the first step that I did do, um, and Keith, please feel free to interrupt me at any point um, while I'm kind of speaking about all this stuff, is we wash the chicken. Um, so washing the chicken is a very important step in Haitian culture, uh, more so in the previous years as there was not much refrigeration. Um, so washing the, uh, the chicken or any of the meats that you're working with, with a uh, vinegar or a lime lemon solution helps to kill off any of the bacteria that would have been growing and help preserve the meat um, for the lack of refrigeration that was there. So I've gone ahead and done that. I removed the skin from the uh, drumsticks um, and discarded that. Then I just scored the chicken. So as you can see, there's some uh, slits in there to help get the marinade in there and just washed it with a mix of vinegar and uh, lime juice. Um, next, you'll see some little green marinade on there. So that's what is called a piece. So a piece is like our seasoning blend for all. We use it for soups, uh, meats, uh, vegetables, and everything. Um, so in here is a mix of scallions, parsley, a lot of garlic, olive oil, onions, uh, bell peppers, and we just use that to cook the meat. So now that I have that all going, I'm just going to get this into the pot on the stove. Beautiful. Chef, while you're doing this and walking us through it, can you tell us a little bit about the word ensemble and how that that came that you guys came to have that as your name? Absolutely. So we when we first launched these dinners, it was more so just bringing the family together. And it wasn't really a brand that was created. It was more of just we're going to we're going to kind of uh, come together as a family cook and then maybe we'll uh, open it up to the community. We ended up did uh, doing so. And with doing that, the first dinner that we launched, we sold over a hundred meals. 
um, my family not really working in the restaurants before, it came as a shock to us all. And I pretty much had to grab the reins and said, all right, let's, let's just do this. I'll run the controls of this all. We just need to prep the food. And uh, mom, you're going to be the workforce behind, behind all the food in the kitchen. Um, so after, I think it was dinner three, that's when I started to realize we really have something unique going on here. And we wanted to be able to bring a new light to the things that we were doing and make it representative. Um, so I started doing some research on what uh, that could possibly mean for us and trying to find a name for a business. It's always difficult. And it took uh, just those couple of months just to realize, okay, what word or phrase could captivate everything that we're doing together? And that just clicked it right there. Ensemble is the Creole word for together. So we're bringing mm -hmm. our family together, we're bringing the food together, and we're sharing this uh, experience all together as we're launching something very new and unique, especially into this area in New Hampshire. Beautiful. So right now I just got the uh, chicken that has been marinated in a piece. Um, it's covered in water. Um, and from here, I'm just gonna bring that up to a boil. And while that's working, I'm going to uh, go ahead and add some of the seasoning also to this water. And chef, that's so as the chicken, piece, right? Yes, that is the air piece. So as the chicken uh, was marinating in the air piece, I'm also gonna add it to this which is going to help season uh, the liquid and provide more flavor because we're gonna use this liquid as the, uh, the finishing sauce for eating the meal as well. Mm. So for these five drumsticks in here, I have about uh, four tablespoons of the apice going in. Beautiful. And chef, question for you. So as, you know, take us back a little bit, like besides, you know, obviously growing, growing up in a household that was Haitian, you know, what really inspired you? Cause you, you had that French background and obviously there's some history between France and, and Haiti, but what really inspired you to say, you know what, this is something that I want to do. Uh, it took a while for me to come to that realization, actually, you know, um, going in culinary school, there's the traditional, okay, you can learn, yes, you learn international backgrounds in this, um, but you do also uh, have like that force structure where you're saying, okay, you can learn how to cook Italian food, you can learn how to cook French food, and that's the end all says all. Um, so coming through the ranks and everything, um, especially after culinary school, I wanted to further my education in the culinary industry. And of course, the best application for that is working in the industry itself. So from there, I um, was encouraged to go seek out um, some of the best restaurants in the, one of the closest major cities nearby, which was uh, Boston. Um, so I reached out and I began my journey at Duave, which is a fine dining French restaurant. From there, I was able to really kind of hold in my skills by working under some of the best chefs um, in, in the state at the time, of course. And they forced it upon me with just like understanding the flavors, the concepts, the techniques that are involved with um, understanding the, the art of French cooking. And later on in my career, that's when I started to kind of gain interest in saying, okay, so I have this relationship with French cooking. I understand some of the techniques involved. How can I apply that to food that I am passionate about, food that I grew up eating? And how can I create that connection, that bond between what I'm doing and what I hope to become? So launching the series of A Taste of Haiti dinners, that kind of helped spark that. And then from there, it kind of went mute. And um, going through Top Chef and understanding those experiences that I did have on the show over there, kind of re-sparked that um, revitalization that I wanted to have and understand more of my culture and and seeing what uh, the community around and uh, what the country is doing to accept new cultures and new foods um, was, it kind of made it easier a little bit just to be able to say, okay, I want to kind of dive back into Haitian food. Is there an opportunity for me to explore that? And seeing on Top Chef how there was that whole Pan-African uh, challenge and kind of uh, evoked a new sense of energy for me to say this is this is kind of like new age this is where the food is going and even with like things you're doing over with atma um, you're able to say okay i love indian food i want to be able to share that indian food with everyone that's kind of like the same interest that i'm having and the same interest that we're seeing all throughout the community where people are interested in learning so much more about other cultures other cuisines that we have the opportunity and it's almost like our duty to share and respect and honor to be able to provide that insight um, that they're, that they're looking for. Mm, that's beautiful, chef. I, uh, we're starting to get a bunch of questions in. So if you guys have questions, put them in the Q and a box and I promise we will go through them. I want to keep kind of going through here. So chef, you said a taste of Haiti and you also have mentioned on some, can you explain the difference of what those two things are? Absolutely. 
So uh, my first Taste of Haiti dinner actually was held with you, Keith. Um, so you've always done a great job of helping me to identify who I was trying to become, kind of like breaking through that mold. Like you saw something uh, more in me than I saw in myself. And I've, I've said this to you multiple times and other people have said that same thing to me. Um, and I think that's just like the constant battle that I'm having. We're saying, okay, I think this is who I am. But other people are like, no, you can be so much more. You just have to break through that and stop just like shying away from who you really are. So when I first launched the Taste of Haiti dinner series, um, that was a modern interpretation of what I understood of Haitian food at the time by utilizing some of the words and phrases of Haitian food. It was in no relation to um, Haitian, authentic Haitian food per se. It was just taking some of the things that I've kind of seen and done and eaten and reimagining them by using like French techniques and things like that. Ensemble then came about a few years, few years later, and that is hardcore, authentic Haitian cuisine cooked by my mom, my dad, and they're kind of pulling the ropes of that. I always tell everybody, I'm, I'm not the chef of Ensemble. I am a student. Uh, my mom is the true chef. And um, together, my siblings, we all work in the kitchen with uh, my parents to learn some of these recipes, and we've been able to kind of create a dry folder which is going to keep record of all these recipes that we have to be able to pass down from generation to generation. And now this second kind of rerun that I'm doing of A Taste of Haiti, I have a much better foundation for um, understanding the recipes that are involved with um, all these items that I'm preparing. And it just helps me to kind of see some of my growth of where I've come um, personally as a chef and realizing that there's so much more that I can explore um, within the realm of understanding more about Haitian cooking and how I can apply a modern day technique or um, flavors with those Haitian flavors as well. That's perfect, Chef. I want to get to some of these questions and then I want to go back because I have a bunch more that I think people will really, really like here. Um, so Marcus was saying, tell us more about the, the isp, um, esp, uh, sorry, I said it wrong, es, ispis, uh, ispis. <laughs> A piece. A piece, a piece. Yeah, he yes. wrote it as that. As a piece, uh, thank you for the correction. Uh, spices in the jar. Can you go over that real quickly one more time? Yes, absolutely. So in the a piece, we have uh, red bell pepper, green bell pepper, yellow bell, orange bell, um, habanero, or traditionally a scotch bonnet, but we haven't been able to find those scotch bonnets around. Um, then we have scallions, parsley, garlic, lime, um, and thyme all in there. So we just take that and we loose, loosely just blend it up. So it's not, it's still chunky in there because you want to be able to see those pieces of spice. Um, but yeah, we just put it in a blender. Um, and commonly you'll see a mortar and pestle being used. Um, in Haiti, it's referred to as a pilon. And one of the favorite memories that I do have, and oftentimes when I'm being interviewed, I share my most distinct memory I can remember as a kid in the kitchen is sitting on the floor with uh, a wooden mortar and pestle um, and grinding be a piece essentially for my mom as she was getting some of the food prepared uh, for our Sunday dinners. Because um, growing up, she would prepare just like the Sunday meals for the week. Because food like this takes so long to prepare, you're not going to do it every single day. So we just get a large pot. You'll see the, sto the stove full every Sunday. Uh, you'll see rice and beans in the back. You'll see chickens. You'll see uh, any fish or anything like that. And it was just like a gathering time. And then Sunday, we know, of course, uh, the meal is fresh. That's the fresh start of the week. We all sit together at the dinner table. And then um, later on in the week, we'll just reheat and we'll have uh, amazing Haitian food all spread throughout. Beautiful, Chef. And in the pots right now, we have the chicken and the apice. Um, what's in the other pots? So in this back pot, um, I know beans take a while to cook. So I actually started soaking the beans last night um, to help kind of absorb some of that moisture and reduce the cooking time. And then right before we jumped on, I just started uh, simmering the beans very low. So that way I'll have beans ready and cooked because we're actually going to use this bean liquid um, to cook the rice in, in a later moment. Awesome. And Sandy asked, uh, why didn't you get rid of the seeds in the peppers that you cut? Are you looking for that spiciness to it? And these peppers in here, um, and bell peppers is not really spice. It's more so a sweet pepper. Um, and we're not too concerned about this. Um, we kind of like leaving it in there as a textural component and we don't really take too much time to kind of de-seed or, or anything like that. I know tr traditionally we're looking for everything nice and clean, uh, clean cuts and making sure all a knife work is perfectly even. And that's kind of one thing that I've had to break the mold of with learning from uh, my mom, my grandmother is just saying, 
you know what, it's okay. The the cuts are going to be what they are. It's It kills my soul to see some of the, the shapes and sizes that come out of it. But at the same time, I understand and respect the fact that, you know what, the, these are some of the best chefs in the world. Um, those who have little or less to none to work with. And if they're able to get these flavors out of uh, these amazing stews and cooking that they're doing without concerning being so concerned about the proper julienne or, uh, or brunoise, then I think... Um, it's okay to respect and understand that uh, we can just have off cuts and uh, take things from there. So chef, I want to talk about representation for Haitian cuisine right now. So you mentioned a lot when it comes to, you know, the difference between ensemble, which is that family atmosphere, that beautiful kind of home style cooking. And then you talked about taste of Haiti, which is a little bit from my understanding, a little bit more kind of refined in its approach to it uh, with kind of modern plating techniques. What are some of the challenges that you face taking Haitian cuisine to a level of quote unquote fine dining, if you will? Right. Uh, so the first part of all this is um, the introduction and the, I guess, just explaining what Haitian food is, what what our culture means to us. And by doing that, then you start to gain that interest in people saying, OK, I want to learn more. I want to explore. I want to see um, where this could go. Uh, but to be able to get to that point, you have to start at the base roots, uh, understanding and respecting the traditions of what Haitian food actually is at its core. Um, and then from there, you can evolve and say, okay, this is, this is what Haitian food is. We've introduced you to this. Now we have a kind of representation of how we can kind of form uh, Haitian food into becoming something that could be more represent, uh, represented in some of the modern day, Ameri uh, modern day restaurants that you are seeing now nowadays. Um, and the challenge with that is oftentimes you associate oh, these offcuts meat or these offcuts or, or food coming from these different countries um, you only are expected to charge X amount for each dish. And what's to say that the amount of work that's going into creating some of these American dishes um, isn't the same amount of work that's going into creating these wonderfully uh, built and crafted dishes that are from uh, generations past, you know? So it's kind of building that uh, rapport and saying, this is just as much work, this is just as much technique, so much skill is involved in here. We need to apply and enhance and kind of continue to just promote the fact that this food uh, should be respected just among the rest of the French, the Italian, the American, all that thing. So chef, a lot of people are asking about the recipe. They really, really want to, uh, to jump in and cook this. Is there a chance that we can get a recipe? Absolutely. I do have a recipe crafted just for uh, this, this exact method that I'm doing right here. So I'll be sure to uh, pass it all uh, along to uh, ACF. And then from there, we can possibly kind of send it out to uh, the groups involved. It'd be amazing. And I know to follow up with the recipe, Chef, you're an author. And uh, a lot of people are saying, do you foresee a cookbook with these recipes? Oh, yes. I would love to get to that point where uh, we can have a cookbook and start building these recipes and uh, promote it to the public and everything. Um, but that all takes time. And the biggest thing right now is just making sure that our family is put together and we are able to kind of learn about all these recipes before we kind of translate that and take the time into developing a cookbook. Amazing. Chef, uh, walk us through. So you just put all of those beautiful bell peppers and the onions. You're kind of making, it seems like you're almost making this great, great stock at this point. Is that correct? Exactly. So yes, in here, now I have bell peppers, onions. I have a habanero, which has been picked with clove. Um, so this habanero in the state right now is not going to uh, add spice per se. It's just going to add the flavor of the habanero. Um, clove you often see cooked with like desserts and things like that, but we do often use that with um, preparing some of our meat and vegetable dishes just because it provides that unique flavor. And I have a bouquet garni with parsley and thyme in there as well. So right now all the flavors are just coming up. Once this comes to a boil, I'm going to remove the chicken and we're just going to brown it. Um, after it's broiled or sometimes fried, then we just put it right back in here, um, which I'm actually going to use this secondary pot over to the other side to kind of build that stew base. Um, so just thinking back on like French technique and everything involved when you're making a stew or a braise, you typically have uh, the meat with the skin or anything on it, uh, or you're going to sear brown the exterior, then you're going to use that and create that fond deglaze, add that to the braising liquid because that builds the flavor here. So I took a step back and kind of realizing this is kind of just the reverse engineered version of that where we are uh, cooking the meat essentially first, making sure all the flavors are trapped inside the meat because this is a shorter cooking process. Then we're going to remove the meat, brown it to kind of get that Maillard reaction and then get it back into the braising liquid with all that caramelized flavor and um, just making sure that the flavors continue to just develop in the pan. 
I bet the smell right now is so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to I want to ask a question about what do you think is one of the big misconceptions when it comes to Haitian cuisine right now? I would say that people think it's spicy. Uh, Haitian food itself is not really spicy. Of course, with any cooking that you're doing, you can control the level of spice that you're putting in, but it's not so much spicy. It's spiced. Um, and the difference between that is just saying uh, we have our own like seasoning blend that we can put on, onto the end um, to create that spice. Or if we wanted to, we can really just like poke that uh, habanero pepper and that will release all the spice that we want to get in. there. But especially when um, cooking for large groups of people who might have not had Haitian food before, we definitely tone back the amount of spice that we would do if we're cooking on a personal level because we can handle a lot of the heat. Um, coming from the Caribbean island and um, some people just don't prefer it that way. So we have uh, a, a vegetable condiment that's called piquis and this is just um, carrots, cabbage, bell peppers, um, habanero peppers sliced up and just pretty much marinated in um, vinegar and lime juice. And so you pretty you have like the sweetness that's coming from the onions, the peppers that just infuse into the uh, vinegar itself and then the spice comes from the habanero peppers. So we use that more so as a condiment to help spice our dishes um, as opposed to adding it in the beginning. So that way everybody can control their own level of spice. Now, Chef, you're a graduate from Johnson & Wales, and you, we've got some wonderful students who I'm sure are watching you today feeling inspired. I want to know what advice would you have for the students who are looking to start their career and maybe they want to cook a cuisine or a style that they feel is kind of either marginalized or underrepresented. What are some of the words of advice you have for them today? I would say just stay true to your heart. Um, even just yesterday, I was having a conversation with a father of a daughter who is Haitian and he's having the same issues of she grew up American and now she doesn't really appreciate her want to understand more about her her background or her history through food and during my teenage years that was the same case we were coming up and then we ate Haitian food all throughout uh, probably till I was maybe 12 13 then from there that's when I was like all right I want pizza I want mac and cheese I want this that the other and you kind of lose sight of who you are and where you came from and what your parents kind of might have been through what your grandparents went through to get everyone um, here and it's just honoring and respecting um, that there's so much more involved in your personal story and it helps to relate yourself um, to your ancestors and to the community around by sharing your story and inspiring others around you to be able to say, okay, this is who I am. I'm not shying away from that person. Um, and I have a story to, to share with you all. Mm, beautiful, Chef. Uh, Teresa asked, she's like, do you keep a jar of a piece in the fridge? Um, and do you make any sort of fermentation version of this or any other vegetable spice mixtures? And I know you mentioned picolis as well, but that's not fermented. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it's just more so just um, marinated just straight in the vinegar and lime solution. Perfect. And so you always kind of keep this in the fridge because you said it's it's a standard spice mix that goes in a lot of different dishes. Is that correct? Yes, that is absolutely correct. So even when we're doing our uh, Haitian dinner series, we have a, it's pretty much an eight quart batch that we make um, at all times for these dinners, just to be able to have for uh, selling by the jar. And also we're using it for uh, the meats, the rice and the beans and things like that. Um, so it's just a, the spice blend that we use just for the pork that we do for the chicken and for marinating fish and things like that. So there's always so much copious amounts just of a piece sitting in the fridge at home, at the restaurant and um, for use of any dish that we're kind of creating. Amazing. Uh, Christopher asked, he said he's looking to clear up some confusion. So we got Haitian Creole versus New Orleans Creole. And he said the similarities seem to be pretty close, um, at least in recipe wise. Can you explain some of the differences? I actually do not know too much about uh, Cajun Creole cooking, um, but Haitian, Haitian Creole I can speak to is just um, building those. It, it seems like there's a correlation between how the process is cooked and kind of just putting your soul into, into the, the food itself. Um, but Haitian Creole is just like using these island Caribbean things that you would find on the island and gathering all those stuff, and which could um, relate to the same of Southern cooking, of saying you're using what's available within your, within your reach and utilizing the full product and how you can kind of make sure that that is uh, represented in the dish that you're making. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Keep these questions coming, Chef. We got about 20 minutes or so until we wrap. You're doing an awesome job. So walk me through the process of what you're doing now. Absolutely. So now I just pulled the chicken from the um, cooking liquid right here. It is popped into the oven. 
to be able to pick up some color. So I'm going to braise, I'm going to broil that. I've got the broiler set on high. So we're going to hope to get some nice color on there. Next in the separate pot over here, I'm going to be adding some uh, tomato paste. And putting that down in just a little bit of oil. Beautiful. We don't want the flavor of like raw paste going in here. I'm just going to toast that just a little bit. And what are we building the base for right here? So this is going to be the base for the food chicken. Oh, beautiful. So I'm going to go ahead and just build this over here. I'm going to uh, take some of this liquid, add this liquid to this pan over here, because this liquid is the one that has all the seasoning built in there. So in there, mm -hmm. there's um, adobo, black pepper, uh, garlic powder, and of course, the apice with the peppers and uh, herbs. So now that this is toasted, I'm just going to go start adding the liquid from here. into here mm. and immediately you can smell the, the transformation of flavors that are going to be developed we have a rich tomato stock going um, with this highly seasoned uh, chicken broth over here i'm just going to try to get some of these peppers and onions make sure that i get that habanero in there and then also pull the herbs from the sachet, transfer it right over. And essentially I'm just gonna want the same amount of liquid that will be able to cover the uh, chicken as it goes back in. So while that's trying to pick up some color down there, we're just gonna kind of continue to let this cook down. And I'm going to start uh, by rinsing off the rice while we're waiting for the beans to kind of do their thing also. Gorgeous. When you start the rice, so, you know, I obviously I'm familiar with, with food from the subcontinent uh, in India, and I know that we spend a lot of time washing rice and washing it and washing it till it runs clear. Is that the same process that you guys do? That is exactly what we're looking for. So the reason why we're doing this is it helps to kind of create the se separate grains of rice by rinsing off the excess starch um, that is coating the grains that will kind of force them to kind of come together when they're being cooked. So this allows you to be able to see the separate grains It provides a much fluffier rice. And the rice that we do use is uh, basmati because it is a uh, fluffier grain and uh, we just like prefer the texture over um, the others. I learned that, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Basmati rice, so good. Uh, are there actually, follow up, is there other, uh, other grains of rice or other styles of rice that, that's used as well or is it primarily basmati? Um, for us, we primarily use basmati, but you can see jasmine um, used as well. It's more so just like a preference or pretty much what you can find around. So cool. Um, Chef, I have a kind of a follow-up question here. I want to keep diving into, into your, your, the history of Haitian cuisine and really kind of where it's, it's coming from you. Uh, you said, you know, you said since your journey, um, obviously it started in kind of fine dining French and it's evolving, you know, at a rapid pace, especially with all the press that you're getting from Ansam and everything. What's, do you think that delving into Haitian cuisine has made you a better chef? And if so, why? Uh, I do. I do. I think part of who I was before was just conforming to what previous chefs have done. And now I'm on that uh, path to exploring who I can become and how I can kind of translate that down to generations prior. So what I am starting to see is that there's uh, more um, cultural diverse um, cuisines that are popping up and even places around this area where I didn't even think there were that many Haitians around we're starting to see through the spread of Ensemble that there's a large Haitian community in New Hampshire that is starting to pick up. And even in places like Nashua, which is Southern New Hampshire and Manchester also, um, we're starting to build this like Haitian community where we're exploring and saying, oh wow, this is, there's, there is Haitian cuisine that is going on. People are starting to appreciate other um, diverse backgrounds now. And I think by me joining in at this time, it's saying I'm part of like that, that new wave of saying, this is where food is going. This is the direction that food is kind of starting to shift to, where we've kind of done all those things saying, um, we've done the French, we've done the Italian. Now let's explore something different. Let's explore the Pan, uh, let's explore the African diaspora. Let's explore um, the other subcontinents and, and make sure that we're representing um, the true flavors and the countries themselves. Beautiful. 
And chef, are we, what are we looking for, for quote unquote doneness of the chicken in there? Are we looking for a little bit of char on that? Or are we going to get that from the searing process? Yes. Yeah, so we're just looking to pick up a little bit of the brown on the exterior from the broil. Okay, perfect. And then from there, we're just going to dunk it right back into uh, the secondary pot that we have over here that has the tomato sauce. Yeah, so I'm very now, jealous of the smells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can almost just imagine what's coming through here. Ugh. So now in this uh, second pot, I went ahead and strained the beans. Um, and I'm going to add a little bit of oil with the apice. So we're going to cook off that raw uh, garlic flavor that's in the apice because it's loaded with garlic. So we just want to make sure that we toast that down. So I'm going to crank this back up. The beans have been removed. Uh, they are cooked. So again, I reserve the strain, the cooking liquid because that's what we're going to be using to cook the rice in. Mm. So we got Chef, we got Joseph. In here. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're just gonna cook the piece down in here. After this is uh, toasted, we're gonna add the bean water, and then once the bean water comes up to a boil, then we'll add the rice into there. Uh, we got a question from Joseph. He's asking, uh, are all the dishes for the restaurant true Haitian dishes or are there blends with some other cuisines and interpretations? So the ensemble dinners that we do, those are authentication dishes. Those are cooked by my mom. All those recipes have been passed down from her and she's still learning on her own too. She's doing some research and kind of developing new recipes as we go along. So those are true authentication uh, dishes. So we do those dinners once a month. Um, with these Taste of Haiti dinners, those are more so a interpretation of what Haitian food and flavors are. So I launched uh, one dinner last week, I think it was, was our kind of third one in this whole series. And I have another one coming up in two weeks. So those are more so my understanding of some of these flavors that we're building and how I can evolve some of these flavors that we're kind of getting in here um, and transform them into what you might see at a fine dining restaurant. Mm. And if you guys don't follow Chef Chris Vio on Instagram, you're doing it wrong. So Chef, how can we, how can we follow you on Instagram? Cause your stuff is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my personal account are, is uh, at Chef Chris Vio, the business accounts I have at Greenleaf Milford and at Alsam underscore NH. And from there, you'll be able to see everything that we have going on for our uh, Greenleaf menus and uh, any of the dinners that we have going on for a Taste of Haiti or our, our authentication cuisine. Busy guy. Some would say. <laughs> so is that the stock from the, or the, uh, the residual from the beans? Yes, so I just added the bean cooking liquid in here. You'll see it's a beautiful brown color and that's going to help kind of change the color of the rice also. And um, now that I have that in here, I'm gonna go ahead and add salt, uh, garlic powder, and adobo. So that's gonna help season the rice and beans itself. Gorgeous. And you're letting that chicken stock still reduce, correct? Yes. So I'm gonna wait to see um, with the chicken after it comes out of here, once it's broiled, I'm gonna put it into this pot over here, and then we're gonna go ahead and just add some more liquid to be able to cover. But I'm just trying to reduce this down so I can make sure that uh, the flavors are all represented in there. It's beautiful. It seems like there's a lot of layering of different flavors that's going on as well. There is, there really is. So you start with just like the initial stage of marinating the meats and from there using that same marinade to cook the chicken down. So all the flavors are incorporated throughout the meat, especially since we had scored it to get the flavors inside. Uh, removing that, searing it, reducing the liquid down that helps to concentrate all the flavors and just kind of mimicking the flavors in the beans and rice itself. So everything works in perfect harmony. Oh, that's beautiful. Chef, question, what is something that surprised you that kind of took you off guard and you didn't know when you started kind of really delving a lot more into Haitian cuisine? Uh, the amount of time everything took. Mm -hmm. um, it was always my mom just doing all the work. And we were like, oh, mom's in the kitchen. She'll be gone all Sunday, just standing in the kitchen doing the work. And we never really understood the process behind everything, why it was taking so long, even though she was preparing the meal for the whole week. But there are so many steps involved of each step of the process that gets to this amazing dish that we're going to be creating um, that takes so much time. And just like learning about why everything is done and why she does the way that she does, it kind of helps to kind of bring awareness to um, respecting more so the cuisine and making sure that we understand and want to honor everything that um, she has been doing. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, I bet you at, at this point, the smells are amazing. Everyone in your house is hungry. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. So now you're adding the rice back in. Is that correct? 
Yes, so I went ahead and brought that up. Um, the liquid is hot, so I added the rice back in. I'm gonna bring that up to a boil now that the rice is in after I'm gonna stir it, and then I'm just gonna cover it. Mm -hmm. And with the a piece, if people really want to like make this and have this as kind of a go-to seasoning, how long does that typically last in the fridge? Uh, because of the amount of um, lime and garlic in there, it'll hold pretty long and even the color will hold itself too. Uh, but typically speaking in like restaurant terms and everything, you don't want to keep anything longer than seven days. So we try to make batches that kind of last in that time frame and make sure that we're using it all throughout. Um, but it could go for two weeks and you'd be perfectly fine with still using it. It tastes the same. The green will still hold. All the flavors will be re well represented. Mm. All right, we're just now starting to pick up a little bit of color on the chicken. So we're gonna give that a little bit longer. Um, these two liquids are continuing to cook down. I'm just gonna give it a little bit of taste now that I have all the seasonings in there. Yep. What I'm looking for is just making sure that there's enough uh, acid from the lime juice that we added. Um, and that kind of starts in the initial stage with the washing of the meats. We have the lime and the vinegar in there. And um, as I was cooking this down, I also added the uh, uh, fresh squeezed lime juice. Mm. So I'm tasting for the citrus, I'm tasting for the salt, I'm tasting to make sure that I can taste the spices that were in the apice, and also the garlic and adobo. Mm. I noticed that one of the things, you know, that, that I'm seeing here is, is just how much beautiful flavoring is going on between the sweetness of the peppers, the spices that are going in there. I've noticed in, in kind of my journey, how you just get this wonderful, like it's, it, it's hard to come back from all these spices when you know how great they are. Do you feel yourself just pushing toward being like, I'm craving, I'm craving Haitian food rather than craving the same stuff that you kind of grew up with? I do. I do. Um, but Luckily for me, I mean, <laughs> my parents live right up the road, so they're always taking care of me. They know I don't eat uh, when I work at the restaurant and everything. So they are still too. cooking Haitian food. Yeah, exactly. They are still cooking Haitian food throughout um, um, for their Sunday meals and everything. So oftentimes even they'll bring food to the restaurant for me to have for uh, my staff meal, um, which is great. So I'm spoiled in that sense. So even when I'm craving something the most, and it could be something that I haven't had before, but it's still uh, traditional Haitian food. They'll just bring it right on over. And um, they keep me well fed and make sure that I have enough energy to get through the day just like they would uh, when I was a child. <laughs> mm. So Chef uh, Christopher's saying he's, he's like, I love the way that you're using your heritage as part of your identity as a chef. Um, he said he's done the same with his Chinese heritage. And the second note that he's asking is, uh, do you serve pikalis, uh, soup jumo, and uh, other versions of Haitian jerk at, uh, at Ansam or at uh, Taste of Haiti? Yeah, so... Um... Peakley's definitely is a, is a staple. And part of when we first launched Peakley's, everybody was like, oh, what is this that I'm eating? What is this spice? What are these uh, pickled vegetables? So from there, we just started offering with every meal and you're able to, of course, control the amount of spice that you're adding. And now we sell it by the jar because there was that much interest for it. Everybody wanted to take it home. You can use it. I put it in grilled cheese. You can put it on a burger and things like that. Um, it just adds a beautiful spice and vinegar and um, kind of sour note to any dish that you're using it for. And soup jamu, that's actually how this all first started. I'm um, going way back uh, a year ago where um, for the first of the year, every year, Haitians all throughout the country, all throughout the world will celebrate by creating a batch of soup jamu. Soup jamu is this dish um, that was controlled by the Haitian slaves that were, they cooked the soup jamu for their um, French masters. And once Haiti gained their independence in the 1800s, we celebrated by kind of taking that soup back and reclaiming it as ours. So we have this beautiful soup with squash, carrots, root vegetables, um, cabbage, and things like that. And it's just this beautiful celebration of our history, our culture. Um, so when launching Ensemble before it was even Ensemble, we introduced uh, a, Sunday, a Sunday pickup for Soup Jumu on New Year's Day. And from there, there was so much interest from it. And that's where the next month we launched a dinner at the end of the month to see, okay, instead of just soup jumu, let's see if we can launch like all Haitian food and see where that brings us. Um, and that's where we had our first hundred orders. And the next month we launched it again, that's where our second hundred orders. And it just kept building and building from there where we were honored to see just how much respect there was and interest from the community around um, that was interested in learning more about Haitian food, Haitian culture through food.
Um, so it brings us great joy to be able to bring, come together as a family, cook these recipes and share on in such a platform being like throughout uh, this community right here where people are traveling sometimes just even yesterday, we had guests coming from an hour away to be able to experience um, what we're offering. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, Chef, we've got about six minutes or so left until we turn it back over to Jackie for some final thoughts. Um, I want to do two things. I want you to walk us through everything that's going on. And then I got a doozy of a question for you. All right. I got to make sure I added the beans back into this rice, which is one step that I do forget. I'm just going to go ahead and stir that back up. And you can see the rice is starting to cook down in there. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and just take this chicken, even though it's not fully brown, it's starting to pick up the color. My oven's moving a little bit slower, but you can start to see that it is getting a little bit of color on it. So we're just going to put it in there. And then this is gonna cook down with the peppers, the onions um, and everything. And um, once that's fully complete, then we have the, the braising liquid that is fully ready to go. We have the seasoned chicken. Everything's going to be like perfectly tender, ready to fall right off the bone. Mm. And we wanna leave that uncovered. And how long do we wanna cook that down for? So this is gonna actually cook down for another uh, 20 minutes. Perfect. And then I worked a little bit of TV magic. So I did have some prepared already with a little bit of the sauce ready to go, just so you can see what the final um, would look like. Um, so as the beans are cooking down, um, they're cooking down in the rice, the rice is getting there. And once we see that all the water is evaporated, then we're gonna take uh, this pot, we're just gonna kill the heat and let it kind of just do the residual steam and make sure that the um, rice kind of does its own thing while soaking up any of the residual water that might be left underneath. Mm. Oh, that looks gorgeous. And I assume that you can adjust the the spicy level of it, not the, just the spice, but, you know, traditionally, is this dish on the spicier side or do you find it to be more mild? Um, again, you can add add or take as much spicy as you would like, um, but we traditionally just make it with this mild base right here. And then we'll use the pickles as a way to enhance the spice level. Wonderful. And that pickles has a lot of acidity to it, which I'm sure just elevates that flavor even more. Absolutely. So chef, big question for you. So Let's in all the studying that you're doing and everything that you're, you're going through here, I, I want to know what's your opinion on why you think Haitian cuisine has not got more representation, specifically not just across the board, but on the fine dining level as well. I think it all starts with somebody wanting to kind of take that leap and say, I'm going to veer off the path and, and do something different and um, not be afraid to just jump for it. And if you fail, you fail, but at least you're kind of going through the, the motions of trying and just wanting to represent um, something that is unique to you and that might not be readily available for others around. Um, I think it kind of just takes a group of people to get together collectively and say, oh, I see what you're doing on this side of the country. Why can't we have that um, over here? And just build that kind of connection with folks around um, that are doing the same amazing things and saying, how have you started this? How have you seen the representation? And what does that mean to you? How can I kind of bring that same um, kind of honor respect to what I want to try to do over here and build that community and just continue the conversation? Um, because that's where it all begins is having that initial um, chat and saying, uh, this is who we are. This is who we wish to become. Why can't our food be represented among some of the greatest? And just continue to just push the boundaries. Mm. Perfectly said, Chef. If you guys are watching this and you love what's going on today, and if you learned something, throw a heart in that chat to give some love to Chef Chris Vio, who is just cooking his soul out today. And I, uh, I love, oh man, I'm just so jealous of the smells. If you guys can't, <laughs> if we can find a way to get smells through Zoom, you know, we've got it here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So as you can see in this this pot over here, this is an actual representation of what everything would look like once it is fully cooked. The um, so this is the first beginning stage where it's starting to stew down. This is the fully developed flavors with the uh, meat ready to just fall right off the bone. And um, the stew sauce is perfectly kind of reduced and um, concentrated in flavors. And then back here, uh, pretty much the rice would be ready in about 10, 12 minutes. Um, but you can see the separate granules. You can see that it kind of shifted the color and you have uh, the beautiful smells of the apice, the garlic, the adobo kind of stewing in there which will again tie the whole dish together and then just finish it off with a little bit of the pickles to add some of your own spice and you have a authentication meal. 
Ah, oh, that is gorgeous. Chef Chris Vio, thank you so much from Ansam, from Greenleaf, to author, to future author of maybe an Ansam cookbook. <laughs> the sky's the limit, my friend. It's, uh, it's amazing being with you today, and I'm so proud of you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you all joining. It means so much to be able to share my culture, share my heritage, and for you all to be so interested to learn some more. Well, thank you. Absolutely amazing. A huge virtual round of applause as we thank uh, Chef Chris for a fantastic demo and for sharing and also to Chef Keith moderating. We, we certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to share your skills and your enthusiasm for the culinary craft with the culinary community of professionals tuning in today and also for the students who are tuning in. So again, very, very much. Um, those who are tuning in, please be on the lookout for a survey that you'll receive tomorrow. Uh, we'll also hope to uh, send you out chef's recipes as well. You'll need to complete the survey in order to earn your one hour of CEH. And we hope that you will join us for our next webinar which will be March 8th as we celebrate International Women's Day. So please do join us. Um, we'll also be in Orlando live for the one day Advanced Culinary Summit on March 10th. And the Advanced Pastry Summit will be in Dallas on March um, May 14th. So don't miss an amazing opportunity to learn from top-notch culinary leaders and to earn your digital badge. Uh, please visit acfchefs.org and click on the events tab in order to register now for the summit or for ACF National Convention out in Las Vegas this summer. So um, again, on behalf of the ACF National Office, uh, thank you to Massachusetts Pro Start for being here and for your support. Of course, thank you to uh, Chef for bringing us this delicious learning opportunity and for being a role model to the chef and uh, culinary experts who are tuning in today. We'll hope to see you all real soon. If you're up in New Hampshire, make sure you stop by Greenleaf in Milford. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.